Would you turn with me to begin with anyway to Numbers chapter 13, the book of Numbers, back to the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and uh, that uh, third one, the book of Numbers, Genesis, or actually fourth, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all right? Go to Numbers 13, if you will. <clears throat> and here, beginning in Numbers 13, the Lord has the nation of Israel right on the brink of enjoying his promise. Remember what he said? He told Abraham, I have a land that I'm going to give you and your descendants. It's a land that God promised to the descendants of Abraham, specifically the Jewish people. And the Israelites were to occupy that land. They were to drive out the inhabitants. They were to occupy that land that God promised to them, but only when the time was right. You know, one of the main reasons that God delivered the Israelites from Egyptian bondage was to fulfill his promise to Abraham and uh, to Abraham's descendants to lead them into this promised land that God said they would inherit and that they would inhabit. In fact, God spoke that promise to Abraham centuries before Numbers 13 happened, historically. And God told Abraham, and Abraham, or rather God told Moses, and Moses then told the people of Israel as they are standing on the... Uh, that uh, land east of the Jordan River, looking into the promised land, he told them, I, God, brought you out that I might bring you in. I brought you out of Egypt so that I might bring you in to the land that I promised to your forefathers. And it's described in the Bible as a land that was a good land. The Israelites were we're agricultural people. And God said, I'm going to lead you into a fertile land. I'm going to lead you into a land. He described it as a land of milk and honey. However, as you perhaps know, the land was already occupied by pagan idolatrous people who were unwilling to let the Israelites have their land without a fight. Look at what God commanded in verse uh, 1 to 3 in chapter 13. The Lord said to Moses, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers, you should send a man, everyone a ruler among them. And so Moses, of course, did what, uh, what was uh, commanded him. What you need to understand what God commanded Moses to do, you need to understand the background of that in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Let me read this to you. You don't have to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and uh, verse 19 to 22, it says, And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all the great and terrible wilderness or desert, which we saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord God commanded us. We came to Kadesh Barnea, that's where they stopped. The next step was across the Jordan River into the promised land. We came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said unto you, you are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers hath said unto thee, fear not neither be discouraged. And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, we will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land and bring us word again by that way we must go up into what cities we shall come. God gave this command in Numbers 13, the first three verses. God gave that command because 
He knew that this is what Israel wanted simply because they did not trust him. God commanded them to send the spies because he was he was lowering himself, so to speak, to meet their unbelief, to meet their distrust in him. It was not God's will, not God's perfect will for these spies to be sent. He's accommodating a distrusting people when he commands what he does there in Numbers chapter 13. That's what I want you to understand. Now, these people were full of fear. They were full of fear. And uh, you know what the thing that drives fear away is? It begins with an F also. You replace fear with faith. They were fearful because they were not faithful. They had fear of entering into that land for different reasons. And I'm not saying that they're that uh, they didn't have legitimate human reasons to fear. But human fears are not legitimate in the face of God's promises and God's power and God's presence. They had phobia. They had phobias. You know, the word that is translated fear in our New Testament, we got our English word phobia from. What is, what are, uh, what is a phobia? A phobia is an anxiety disorder that is, the, that is defined by an irrational and unrealistic, a persistent and an excessive fear of an object or a situation. And if that object or situation is unavoidable, it brings on deep, significant distress. And this is where Israel was at Kadesh Barnea. They had developed a real phobia about obeying God and entering the land that God promised that they were to inherit and to inhabit. You know, there's a New Testament parallel to Numbers 13 and Numbers 14 when Israel balked because of their phobia, because of their fear there at Kadesh Barnea and did not want to move forward trusting God into that land that God promised them. There's a New Testament parallel. It's Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. And in Hebrews 3 and 4, the writer of Hebrews warns these early believers, these early Jewish believers that this book of Hebrews is written to, but also applying to us. He warns them about disobeying God because they didn't trust him and entering into a Christian life in which you have peace and rest because you trust God. And you're not filled with anxiety, and you're not filled with phobias, and you don't uh, you don't have stress in your life because you are trusting the Lord and you are spiritually resting in Him. The promised land that the Israelites were to enter, inherit, and inhabit was to be to them a land of blessing, a land of plenty. Yes. There were battles. There were enemies to be encountered, but they were to be victorious through the, the presence and power of the Lord. And yes, life for the believer here now on this planet, in our culture, in our society, is not a picnic. Everything is really against us, so to speak. Our culture is anti-Christian. Our culture is really anti-God. And uh, we're up against battles. But folks, we can't live in fear. We can't live as, belie as believers that uh, are afraid to open our mouths, are afraid to let it be known that we belong to Jesus and that we are here not for ourselves but for him. We need to enter into this spiritual promised land, which is a life of rest, which is a life of real peace, 
because you're trusting in the Lord. Now, look at, uh, again, uh, the fear that uh, is inherent in these Israelites as they stand there on the brink of the Jordan River to cross into the promised land. In that, uh, that those first three verses in chapter 13 that we've just already read, where God says, okay, you want spies? Send your spies. Send a, a leader from each of the 12 tribes. Pick one to be one of the spies. Send them. God commands that. God does not command those spies to be sent so that they come back and instill fear in the congregation of Israelites but rather so that they come back and that they uh, produce confidence in the congregation that God's promises are true. You know what? It is a land that is flowing with milk and honey. They did admit that when they, when they returned. You and I are to go forward every day in our believing life. We're to go forward trusting that God will give us the victory no matter what we face. And we don't know what we're going to face. But we need to go forward every day trusting that we are, are that, 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 that God, who is the victor, is present with us. And he has the power and the ability to overcome all the obstacles, whatever they might be in our mind, whatever we might be fearful of, whatever we might have to deal with. Perhaps we've had tremendous defeats in the past in certain areas in our life. But look, you have the presence and power of God in you. You don't have to fear falling like that. God can give you the victory. You can rest in him. You can trust him for that. These people were really rebelling against God. They were rebels. And yet think about it. Think of what these people had experienced. God had miraculously delivered these millions of people out of 400 years of Egyptian slavery and bondage. And not only that, when they were chased by the, by the premier uh, military of their day, the Egyptian army, chariots and all, thousands of, of horsemen and, and infantrymen, when they were chased and they were hemmed in and had nowhere to turn, they were facing the Red Sea. God miraculously parted the waters of that Red Sea. These people had seen all that. They had been delivered. They had experienced the exodus. They had experienced that Red Sea crossing. Amazing, isn't it? How quickly we can forget what God's done for us. That's a danger. To forget what God has done for you how God has redeemed you, how God has delivered you in the past. Don't forget that. That's what happened to them. In fact, you might ask yourself and think right now, what past experiences of God's power to deliver me convinces me that he can deliver me now and he can deliver me in the future, whatever battle I might face. You might know what the battles are, you, and some you don't know. But on the basis of God's past working and powerful deliverance in your life, can you trust him for what you're facing now and in the future as well? Interesting to me also, in verse 27 to 33 of uh, Numbers 13, look at that with me. Here the spies have returned, and they returned with uh, some of the fruit of the land. And uh, in verse 27, they told him, we came into the land which you sent us, and surely, you know what? It, it's right. You, God was right. It flows with milk and honey. And look, here's some of the fruit of it. They brought some huge cluster, such a huge cluster of grapes that it had to be carried between two men on a, on a pole. It was that heavy with grapes. So here's some of the fruit of it. Ah, but look at verse 28. Ah, but there's always the, you know, here's the nevertheless, but the people, they'd be strong. 
They dwell in the, uh, that dwell in the land. Their cities are walled. We can't penetrate and break those walls. Uh, the, the cities are walled and they're very great. And oh, by the way, some of the people are giants. We saw the sons of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they dwell on the mountains. And the Canaanites, they dwell by the sea coast and by the Jordan River. In verse 30, and Caleb, he was one of the 12 spies. Caleb stilled the people. He said, calm down, relax. He stilled the people before Moses. And he said, let's go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. That's the kind of heart, that's the kind of attitude that every single one of us needs as we face a new day. We can overcome it, not in our strength, but we have the presence and power of God that parted the Red Sea with us. And then verse 31, but the men that went up with him, that is the other 10 spies, they said, we're not able to go up against this people. They're stronger than we are. And they brought an evil report of the land which they had searched to the children of Israel. And they said, the land through which we've gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants. All the people we saw in it are men of great, they're, they're giants. Verse 33, and we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, uh, uh, which come of the giants. And in their own sight, we were as grasshoppers. That's the majority opinion. Of 12 spies, that's the opinion of 10 of the 12 right there. You want to follow the, the majority? You think it's wise to follow a majority? The majority opinion is 10 spies that return from that uh, reconnaissance mission are filled with fear and they are choosing their future based on their phobia, based on their fear and uh, their anxiety and their unbelief in God. And that is contagious and it spreads and it instills fear and phobia in the Israelite nation. And so they chose to not trust God. And so the nation chooses to not trust God. You see how dangerous it is to take this kind of an attitude, to just uh, think and let fear grip you and live your life on the basis of anxieties that you have, whether it be real or imagined, you can't live that way. I remember uh, hearing that saying that is attributed to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, when he was the president during uh, the war, World War II. He said, the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself. Well, let me tell you something better than that. Here's a better saying. The only thing that you and I have to fear is ourselves. Because we're our worst enemy. Because of the phobias, because of the fears and the anxieties that really, if you boil it all down, it's simply unbelief. We don't trust God. We don't believe God. And so we allow these fears to eat us up. You are the only one that can prevent yourself from fulfilling the future will of God for your life. Because it's a choice you make. No one else makes it for you. So you can't allow fear to intrude, to lead you down the path of your self-centered ways into your own future. That's why we're told to deny ourselves, because fear would grip us and would paralyze us. In the next chapter, got your Bible, Numbers 14. Look at the first four verses. All the congregation, when they heard the majority opinion, all the congregation lifted up their voice and they cried. The people wept. Look at this. They wept that night. All night long, all they did was cry. And the children of Israel murmured, they grumbled, they complained against Moses and Aaron, the leaders, 
And the whole congregation said unto them, verse 2, Oh, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Now we're going to die in the desert. Why has the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our children are going to be prey. Wasn't it, wouldn't it be better for us to turn around and return back to Egypt? And they said, verse 4, let's, let's uh, choose a leader and return to Egypt. Wow. You know, one of the leading characteristics of unbelief, of not trusting God, not relying upon him, is that we grumble, we complain, we murmur. And when we do so, whether we realize it or not, we are indirectly blaming God for the things that we fear and the things that we don't like. These people are grumbling. And they want to throw in the towel. They want to go back to what God delivered them from. What kind of a defeated life is that? Drop down in chapter 14 with me one more time to verse 20 to 25. Look at what happens here. The Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. What happened was God got angry. And uh, he said, look, I've had it with these people, Moses. And Moses and Aaron stood in the gap, so to speak, and pled for the people that God wouldn't destroy them. And so that's what he means in verse 20. But here's what God says, verse 21, as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt, in the desert, and have tested me or tempted me now these 10 times and haven't hearkened to my voice, haven't obeyed, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it, except my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and he's followed fully. He's followed me fully. I'll bring him into the land that he searched out, and his offspring will possess it. And the Am Amalekites, the Canaanites, dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow, turn you and get into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. You know what this really amounts to? The people of God have missed a golden opportunity. This is an opportunity missed. And I want to put that on a personal level by way of application. How many believers live their whole life wandering in a spiritual desert of unbelief and never really experienced the abundant life that Jesus offered to his people. How many believers die in the desert of unbelief, living their lives in fear and anxiety instead of bold courage and peace and rest that God offers? missed opportunity on a personal level. But look with me at verse 31 to 33. This is ominous. But your little ones, which you said would be a prey, them I'm going to bring into the promised land. They'll know the land which you've despised. But as for you, your carcasses are going to fall in the desert and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your sin until your carcasses be wasted in the desert, in the, in the wilderness. Now, here's something about an opportunity missed. It not only impacts you personally, but it impacts people generationally. Future generations are impacted when we hold on to our phobias, when we are filled with fear and anxiety and, uh, and do not believe God, do not trust him. Families and entire generations suffer the same consequences because their parents were filled with unbelief. Is that what you want for your kids? Is that what you want for your grandchildren? There's a penalty. Look at verse 43 of chapter 14. The Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, 
and you shall fall by the sword because you turned away from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord will not be with you. Wow. Here's the point. The fact of the matter is, God, de God deserts people in the desert who refuse to trust him. Now, let me apply that to us who are believers. If you desert God, God will desert you to your own ways and the consequences because you were paralyzed by unbelief. If you desert God, God will desert you to your own ways. And that's going to be consequences. And I don't think any of us want that. Look at verse 39 to 45 uh, in this chapter. In verse 39, Moses told the children of Israel what God said, that because you wouldn't, uh, because of your fear, you wouldn't trust God to go into the, the promised land. Okay, well, guess what? You're going to go 40 years in the desert. For the 40 days that the spies uh, spied out the land, you're going to spend 40 years until you all die off, those that are 20 years and above. So he told the people, and they mourned greatly, verse 39 says. And they rose up early in the morning, and they got up to the top of the mountain saying, okay, okay, we'll go now. We'll do what, God's, uh, what God said. We'll believe his promise. We've sinned. Verse 40, Moses said, why do you transgress the command of the Lord? You go, but you'll not prosper. Go not up. The Lord's not among you that you be not smitten by your enemies. You're going to fall by the sword if you try it now. You know what this tells us? This is really serious business, folks. Sometimes it's too late to obey God. Sometimes it's too late to obey. Israel became unworthy of the opportunity that God provided them because of their unbelief that was driven by their fear. And because they refused this great opportunity of entering into the promised land, they spent their lifetime in endless wandering. You see, opportunities don't stand waiting at the door. You either seize them while they're available or you may lose them forever. You see how important it is that we believe God? You may not have an opportunity to backtrack. They didn't. Sometimes you do. But don't count on it always. These people didn't. So let's go then to the New Testament parallel in Hebrews chapter 4. And we're almost done. Hebrews 4. Just a, a few verses up in the third chapter. With whom was he grieved 40 years? Them that sinned, those that were filled with their fear, their phobia, and, and that didn't believe and trust God to enter. He was, he was grieved with them. And verse 19 of chapter 3, so we see they could not enter, meaning the promised land, because of their unbelief. So, how does that apply to us? Chapter 4, verse 1. Let us, therefore, fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us the gospel was preached as well as unto them, but the word that God preached to them through Moses, didn't profit them because they didn't believe God. It wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. He says, therefore, let us fear. Verse 1, see that? Christians, we ought to tremble with fear that we may fail to experience entrance into God's promised land of rest. 
God's promised land of rest is only entered by you personally believing and claiming the promise of God. It's talking about spiritual rest, not talking about salvation, but it's talking about saved people walking by faith and trusting God and believing him despite their circumstances, their situation, or the objects that they face. Look at uh, verses 6 through 10 of this fourth chapter. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of their unbelief. That's the Israelites. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying David, uh, in David, today, after so long a time, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. They were still resisting God in David's day. For if Joshua, verse 8, had given them rest, he's the one that God used to lead them into the promised land, eventually that second, that new generation. He would not have spoken of another day of rest. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people of God. You are the people of God if you're a believer. And there is a spiritual rest that you can claim right here and now. And he that is entered into his rest hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. To fail to enter God's promised spiritual rest is absolute disobedience. It's disobedience. And he says, this rest is not just God's offered provision, it's his commandment. We have, we don't have a choice. We're supposed to follow his command. You want to follow the command of the Lord? Enter into his rest. He commands it. And if you don't, if you don't enjoy spiritual rest, if you don't enter into this spiritual promised land, you are disobedient to God and you're defying him. It's defiance. Well, what's the remedy? Well, let, look down with me in verse 12 to 14. Here's the remedy to it. Okay, here's how you fix it. <laughs> if you feel like you haven't entered into that spiritual rest and you, and you want to know how to fix it, here it is. Here's the remedy, verses 12 to 16. Have you ever, uh, perhaps you've memorized verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing uh, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit uh, and joint and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And you, you've learned that verse, but you don't know the context of it. Here's the context of it. It's the answer to all you fear that is causing you to not believe God and to disobey him. What verse 12 is telling us that the word of God or Bible truth lays bare our heart and totally exposes our unbelief and our disobedience. The Word of God is like a two-edged sword that pierces to dividing the soul and the spirit, the joints and marrow, and discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart, and no creature is not revealed or made manifest or laid bare. All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The function of the word of God is to expose our unbelief and our disobedience regarding this matter of unbelief, not trusting God and being filled with fear and being driven and paralyzed by fear and not going forward in faith. And so the remedy is let God's truth expose your unbelief. Let God's truth expose your disobedience. The Bible is here to hold you accountable to God for when you defy him. And it also points the way to God so that you can run to him. As the next two verses say, we have a high priest, Jesus. He's uh, He can be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses, our infirmities, because he was a human being on this earth. And so let us, therefore, verse 16, come, therefore, 
boldly unto the throne of grace where he is, that we might obtain mercy and grace to help us in the time of need. Here's the remedy. Bible truth lays you bare and totally exposes your unbelief, your defiance, and your disobedience to God, holds you accountable to God, but also it points the way to Jesus. For you to run to Jesus for mercy and for strength to enable you to obey, to enable you to believe. You draw near to God and you claim the future that he has for you. That's the remedy. Hope this makes sense.